is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is crackling, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and numberfire.com as we are getting you set for college football week 12 and taking an early look at some college basketball numbers for this year as well and what Ed's numbers say in general, how his model works. So a good deep dive into college basketball to get you set for this year. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here as always by Ed Fang of thepowerrank.com. You can find Ed on Twitter at thepowerrankEd. Happy college basketball season to you. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm not sure what's crackling. I feel like I need to order something from Amazon and snap yeah. some bubbles. That's always my intro for the Heat Check podcast. And for some oh. reason, I decided to do it for this one. And I, I was like halfway through the word, and I was like, wait a minute. This is not well, the right good. podcast. Well, it's up a little bit. I mean, with all the audio that you do, I'm not surprised that you get it mixed up once in a while. Well, I've called, like, so J.J. Zacharyson is my boss. And I have called okay. him the wrong title. For because like I have to I do a, a pod, two podcasts <laughs> week with you I do two per or three p- per week with Brandon Gadula my coworker and I do one with JJ and I said that JJ was the managing editor for Number Fire and he's the editor in chief and like halfway through saying it I'm like oh no I'm gonna get fired JJ's a very nice guy and he would never yep. fire me for something so so stupid but like I just like go on like autopilot and forget where I am what <laughs> dimension it is what city I'm in and it's it's wild yeah. And the probability that that happens goes up with more shows that you do. Exactly. So when I get up to your level of shows, (laughs) I actually screwed up a bunch on my podcast this week, which is why I'm really thankful that I have uh, my guy, David, that edits it all later. But I was doing it at 1030 p.m. last night. Yeah. Just not as sharp at 1030 p.m. No, I'm not as sharp at any time at this point in the year because we're so far into the muck uh, where I've said – well, what's up, everyone, or whatever, 15,000 times by this time. Uh, I calculated in, like, I had a performance review last year, and I had to calculate the number of podcasts I did, and it was depressing, I would say, uh, <laughs> the number, just because it's like, oh, Lawrence. I spend a lot of time talking to myself every week, and it's or very weird. it's inspiring how much you spend talking to yourself. That's, that's not the word I would use, but I appreciate the thought process behind that uh but i think this is gonna be a fun one ed because we get to talk a little bit of college basketball i have had the pleasure of talking to you about college basketball for i think the past three or four years now to preview them to preview march madness but i haven't gotten to talk to you in season about your model so we're gonna get to dive deep on that today talk a little college football too but before we do that uh the new college football rankings came out last night and we're gonna take a look at what your model says about probabilities of making the playoffs and stuff uh but overall impressions for you around the college football rankings last night yeah you know everyone was looking for where minnesota was going to end up they take a, a rocket ship from the low teens up to eighth uh obviously pretty interesting they're not going to be there for long, so we can talk about that <laughs> a little bit later. Right, and we'll talk about Minnesota because we have to go through last week as well. We're going to take a look at that uh, mm-hmm. with Rufus Peabody and the numbers we had with him, and then we'll dive in to week number 12 as well. But I thought it was uh, – I thought Georgia was very interesting. Maybe we'll talk about them too when we talk sure. about your numbers. Uh, but we'll do that in a little bit. We'll have our NFL podcast going up tomorrow with Edward Egros, breaking down week 11 of the NFL. We'll talk some Cowboys, of course, if we have Edward on the show, and break down his favorite bets on the board to get that podcast right as it is posted make sure you subscribe to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast and make while you're there please leave a rating and review as well because those do help us out a ton let's take a look back at last week on the college show and break down what went wrong what went right and uh, then get set for week number 12 covering the past All right, on the week 11 edition of Covering the Spread for the college football version, we had Rufus Peabody of Massey Peabody on to preview the week. You can follow Rufus on Twitter, at Rufus Peabody. And you and Rufus had opposing sides of Minnesota versus Penn State. (laughs) Rufus won the Minnesota side. You wanted Penn State minus seven, and Minnesota won that game outright. But obviously things have changed a lot. After that Minnesota game, we mentioned the college football playoff, uh, changing their ranking of Minnesota drastically. After that game, what do your numbers say about this Minnesota team? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to say that, you know, Rufus is, again, the one person you don't want to be on the opposite (laughs) side of a side on. And, uh, yeah, that didn't go well for me, which is not surprising. 
Um, but yeah, so so Minnesota definitely went up. They were 34th in the the college football rankings that I calculate for members of my site. Uh, they're up to 25th. Uh, still, still not great, but but they're in the top 25. Uh, their rating went up almost by two points. So definitely a great performance uh, by Minnesota. And I think from my perspective, it's simultaneously thinking yes, Minnesota so showed me something in that game, sure. but also no, they're they're not a legit playoff contender. And I think that that could allow us to be interested in betting against them if the numbers are still down in Minnesota. They've got momentum, or they've got this buzz now. They, you know, they start in the field. Right. They're up to eighth in the playoff rankings, and maybe that would push us to buy against them. That against them. The problem is that they're actually underdogs this week. They're on the road and facing right. Iowa as a three-point dog there, and I feel like the market is being kind of smart with Minnesota. Uh, so they're right. not really overreacting, I guess I would say. What is your impression of what the market has done with Minnesota based on that game? Yeah, I mean, the markets are pretty good. Uh, you yeah. know, my number is is Iowa by 4.7. Yeah. Um, so it still suggests value with Iowa at home. Look, you got, I mean, think, let's think back to that game, right? Yeah. Tanner Morgan essentially went Phil Sims in the Super Bowl <laughs> in that game. I mean, he had a terrific game. And partially that was his brilliance. Partially was the inability of uh, Tariq Castro Fields to to cover uh, in the in the Penn State secondary. So and and, and Penn State de- definitely did not play their best game. Still had a chance to win at the end. Couldn't get it yeah. done. That's going to happen. Um, so yeah, I mean I I'm I'm uh, like I said I, I've I've upgraded Minnesota in my mind, but still not too much. And I think, like we said last week, there were a lot of reasons to be skeptical of Minnesota. I was skeptical that their big playability would continue on offense, and it did. So that's right. not always going to be the case. Uh, but I, I, I definitely understand the thought process there. Uh, but kudos to Rufus for nailing that one, too. Rufus also mentioned that he was leaning LSU plus six and a half. And they won that game outright. Uh, so another good call there by Rufus. He said that he bet Oklahoma minus 13. But he was wary of that number because it was at 14 when we talked. Oklahoma got out to a pretty big lead in that game. But Brock Purdy, our guy's coming back. He led the comeback train to make it close and cover there. Uh, Rufus had Hawaii minus 7.5. Kind of a tough loss here because Hawaii was up 9 with under 5 minutes left. San Jose State scored to make it a 2-point game. And then Hawaii got the ball back with 151 left. They got a first down. They were able to ice that game. So... Bit of a tough loss, uh, tough luck loss there. A little bit of backdoor cover by uh, San Jose State in that one. And finally, Rufus mentioned Virginia Tech as a home dog of plus or of two and a half points, and they won that game pretty easily, thirty six to seventeen. So Rufus was on uh, two or three underdogs who won the game outright. So a uh, really good week by Rufus there. Uh, Were you follow- watching the end of that Hawaii game? I was not. Go no. What no? <laughs> I'm so impressed, close. Jim. <laughs> Staying um, up till two thirty. 2 30 a.m. or whatever that must have ended no i was up at seven the next morning so i was very <laughs> much not awake we like my ability to stay awake is so limited now and we had been up we were at a show um at a casino here in, in near syracuse on friday night which meant right. that my one night where i go to bed after 10 30 had already been expended so there was zero <laughs> chance um <laughs> But I looked at the box score the next day and saw that it was a pretty tough draw there for Rufus. But still, really good week for Rufus. So follow him on Twitter, at Rufus Peabody. Uh, I had the over on Clemson versus NC State at 53 points. Did follow that one, partly because I thought Clemson uh, could go over by themselves, and they did. Uh, They won that one 55-10. to It's going to talk more about Clemson again in covering the future again today because that offense is pretty interesting. We'll probably talk about them uh, with regards to the college football playoff too in just one second. But first, if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia or Indiana. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's move forward to week number 12 now of college football, but before we do that, we want to dive in on Ed's numbers for college basketball, how your different models work, uh, what all goes into them. We're going to get a deep dive in college basketball so people can start to bet on that, and then we'll talk some week 12 college football as well. So let's do that right now with Covering the Present. Covering the Present. 
All right, we are now about a week into the college basketball season. Things got underway last week. We've got a couple of games under the belt for each team so far. So I felt like it was a good time to talk with Ed about his numbers on the power rank and how they work when it comes to college basketball because Ed has helped me win my brackets, uh, I think, two or three straight years now over at the Number Fire Staff League. So thank you, Ed, for that. So I trust your college basketball numbers a lot, personally, which means that I'm excited for everyone else to get to hear about them. So... I want to hear about college basketball and your process behind building your models. And I say models, plural, because you have two. Uh, so what are the two separate models and what goes into them? Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of things are, are, are pretty much similar to, to what I do in football. Um, one big component is the markets. So I take closing point spreads and then I adjust for who you played with the ranking algorithms that I have. And those are called my market rankings. I mean, I, I have them for college football. Uh, I have them for the NFL, and I do them as well for 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 college basketball. And it's essentially, you know, I mean, the market is a good predictor. So let's take all that data and let's use it to project forward. Now, obviously, things are going to change, things are going to shift, uh, but that's definitely one component. And then the other thing I do is uh, I I have like a game based estimate of of how good a team is. So you take points per possession, you adjust for strength of schedule on offense and defense. Uh, and you get a set of rankings. And this is analogous to what Ken Pomeroy does on his site. Uh, my algorithm is a little bit different, but the results are usually, you know, roughly the same. There'll probably be some more differences earlier in the season. Um, but, you know, with what I do in college basketball and what I do with football as well, it's, it's always a combination of some kind of preseason prior, the market rankings, and then data from the current season. And at what point in the year... Do you start to feel really good about that model and what it says? Like, how much data do you need before you start to feel really good about the strength in that model? Yeah. So for college basketball, I have no idea. <laughs> and, and, and I tell you that because, like, I've actually been, um, you know, just the evolution of my business. Like, you know, it was it was a no brainer to kind of focus mostly on football as yeah. as my business. There's there's the most betting interest in that. And, you know, Ken Pomeroy was already around as, as the college basketball guy. And, and there's just not a, a big enough market for college basketball to, right. to kind of have more than, than one player there. So my college basketball interest is always focused on March Madness. It's something that uh, there is obviously a lot of interest, a lot of public interest. Um, and it actually serves uh, – it's really good for my business heading into the next football season, if you can kind of believe right. that as well. Um, actually, you guys at Number Fire have known that for years. <laughs> so – so yes, so so most of the time I'm usually really busy about with with football right now. I end up getting my college basketball numbers rolling like late December, early January because I need them for March. And you know the numbers are one component of what I do for college basketball and winning your March Madness pool. But a whole other segment of that is is contrarian approach and and how to kind of fade the other people in your bracket. This is what you 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 have used, Jim, uh, to win the number fire bracket, which which is I definitely count as one of my best accomplishments in life <laughs> because that's that should not be an easy pool to win. No. So and, it, and sharks. It, you know, well, and it just warms my heart that you actually listen to me. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Great well. It's great. I mean, like I, have, uh, I, I have no knowledge myself, so I've got to listen to you. <laughs> so, so for college basketball, like I actually have all my data running right now. Um, mm -hmm. We're collecting things. Uh, I tried to get some rankings for this show, and my computer said barf. <laughs> I'm not gonna do this for you in any kind of reasonable amount of time. So I was like, okay, that's fine. Um, but you know, kind of my approach is. Um, and, and this goes for football as well. Like what I look for is how good each of these models are doing compared to the game results. OK, so I use uh, like a root mean squared estimator. So for any one game, you look at like how the game actually finished in terms of margin of victory and you see how close that was to your actual prediction. Right. And that's your RMS error. And. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at the three components, like the preseason prior, the market, and then the database. And this year, you track how those things evolve over time because you know I haven't had a chance to go back and look at that historically, but it probably means most to look at it this season. You, so I, I found RMS to be like, it's, it's kind of a pretty smooth predictor. 
yeah. in the sense like if you looked at how the model did against the spread, that's going to tend to jump around quite a bit. And that doesn't give you as good as smooth a predictor as, as when you look at the root mean squared error. Um, so, for example, when I was talking about success rate and I introduced that into my model, I only did that after I knew how good it performed the previous six or right. seven weeks in college football. And it performed really well, which is why I was pretty confident that I could put that in my model. Same thing with uh, with with college basketball. As I go forward the next couple of weeks, we'll figure out like week by week how are these each of these predictors changing. Uh, not only does that give a sense of like how well your model is working, but it gives you a sense for how much you should weight each one as the season progresses. And uh, yeah, just go go forward from there. And I think that right now, obviously, a lot of this is going to be based on the preseason. You know, your prior and you know what you thought of a team right. going into the year. What are some of the components there? Is it looking back at what they did the previous year? Is it preseason rankings? You know, what goes into your, your prior there? Yeah, I don't do it. So I let other people <laughs> spend more time on college basketball than I do uh, do that part. Yep. And uh, I trust them to do a good job. Okay, um, But, I like you know, it. I mean, you can also get data from like the preseason polls. Yeah. So I've actually done some work to show that, you know, the preseason polls are a better predictor of tournament performance than the RPI that the committee used to use. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you get some data there. Um, and, you know, I think there's a ton of interest in college basketball these first two months because it's it's beatable, right? right? The books are focused on football. they got a lot of other things going, the NBA. And betters for a long time have known that college basketball is particularly beatable these first two months of the season. You know, just for example, like right angle sports has been – has been doing really well in college basketball, especially these first two months. And it's it's just hard work, right? Like they right. know more about these teams than the books do. Uh, they know about every transfer coming into these these smaller programs. And um, yeah, so so that's that's uh, I think that's why a lot of people are rightfully interested in college basketball right now. Right. That is what's motivating me to get my numbers together earlier uh, for members on my site. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there and see how it goes. One of the things we talk about a lot with college football is looking at predictive numbers and numbers we can look at that will tell us what we can expect going forward. If you were trying to pinpoint, like for a person trying to get into college basketball betting, what are some numbers you would look at that can either say the strength of a team or can spot teams that maybe do for positive or negative regression? Yeah. Again, uh, you know, the first thing you want to understand is, is points per possession. So it's something that adjusts for pace. You know, some teams like a North Carolina are going to play a lot faster than a team like Virginia. When you look at points possession, it accounts for that. So that's the first baseline thing. And, and like I mentioned before, you know, what, what I do on my site, what Ken Pomeroy does, takes points per possession, adjusts for schedule based on offense and defense, and goes from there. Um, you know, the next thing is you look for sources of randomness. And one big source of randomness in college, in, in basketball in general, is the three-point shot. So Ken Pomeroy has done a lot of really interesting work to show that, you know, how a team defends the three in the early part of the season has almost zero ability to predict how they're going to defend the three later in the season. Right. So we essentially say randomness plays a big role in the three-pointer. So one thing you can look for early in the season, like let's say you have a team that you like, you think they're going to be strong uh, in their conference, but they're they're doing poorly early in the season. But that's because they've given up 50% field goal percentage from three-point range. You're obviously going to lose a lot of games if you do that. Well, the analytics says that's going to regress towards the mean, and that team is probably a lot better than even their efficiency numbers say. Mm -hmm. And is three-point attempt rate against something that we can – is that more sticky? Like they allow a lot of attempted three pointers. So that's something we can look at. <laughs> yep. Or is that also a bit more random? No. So that's actually pretty sticky. Right. Uh, way more sticky than you think. So the you it it is in somewhat predictive for a defense to not allow other teams to shoot three pointers. This was an evolution in Michigan basketball. Uh, yeah. John Beeline about two or three years ago decided, nope, we're not we're not going to mess with a three point shot. We're going right. to we're going to run guys off the line and we're going to make that a priority. And you could see a big evolution in the fraction of field goal attempts they allowed from three. Um, but it's also interesting, like Virginia has been a great defensive team over the last uh, however many years under Tony Bennett. They, they'll let you shoot the three. Yeah. 
Um, they've still been great defensively in terms of their efficiency. Um, but, you know, when they have a bad year, it's usually because it, it just happened to be that teams are shooting better from behind the arc. Right. Interesting. And I think that it's it's a fun field to get into. As I said, I know nothing about it, which is why I'm asking you instead. Uh, but it's an interesting, interesting market for sure. Anything else you'd want to point out uh, as far as early season college basketball stuff? Anything else that's interesting from your numbers or anything? Yeah, I mean, I think that basically covers it. I mean, yeah. again, like I said, you know, this is a point of year where the more work you do, the the more it's going to pay off. Right. Right. Um, there's a lot of college basketball teams that they're setting lines for. And if you know something about uh, these small schools that are not a lot of other people are studying, it could potentially give you a pretty big edge. And in general, that's a good way to play things because you want to go into markets that are less saturated and less sharp, right. which is why I look a lot at NASCAR because there aren't a ton of people betting NASCAR uh, right. because, and I think that trying to find, Things you know, things about sports, whether it be a sport, a team, etc., that the market and the bookmakers may not know as much about. It's a really advantageous way to play things, and I think that's a definitely something to keep in mind as a better. Try to find your strengths, and if it's different than where the books are strong, that's a good way to play it as well. We'll talk plenty more college basketball as the year goes along, as we get closer to March and stuff. So we'll definitely revisit Ed's numbers then. But I also want to talk to you about college football because you actually put a post up on the Power Rank, I believe, today about last night's college football playoff rankings and some takeaways from that. I think the big one that stands out to me, Ed, is Clemson, because Clemson was fifth in the first pow- the first rankings, and we basically said it's irrelevant for them because they right. were someone was going to lose LSU-Alabama. Clemson would probably get their way back into the top four, and Clemson's probably not going to lose before the college football playoff. How right. certain are your numbers that Clemson is going to be a member of that four-team playoff? Yeah, they're the most certain about Clemson over any other team. Is at 88% right now. Uh, I mean, basically, they're they they're, they have Wake Forest. Uh, they travel to South Carolina, who's playing a freshman at quarterback, mm-hmm. who was not supposed to be the starter this year. Yeah. And then they most likely get Virginia in, in the ACC championship game. Um, my numbers would make them an 18-point favorite in that game right now. So you know, you can kind of pencil them in right now. Um, I also did a little bit more of a deep dive into their offense and and you know whether anything's wrong with Trevor Lawrence. You know, when I look at their success rate. For on passing plays, you know, they're and and after adjusting for schedule, they're they're only 45th in the nation, which suggests a little bit of a problem. But from a, from a lot of other metrics, uh, I think things are going to be fine on, on that side of the ball for Clemson, and you're going to see them make the playoff, and not only that, just uh, contend for another national championship. Right. So they they're benefited from a plus schedule here for sure, and it's probably not going to be a soft enough schedule to really ding them to the point where they don't make the playoff, but uh, they should be pretty pretty firm ground here. What about Minnesota? Because they did move up to number eight. They were, I believe, 18 last week, but that big win against Penn State, obviously a lot more validity toward them from the committee. Do you think that Minnesota has a chance to make a run here? Obviously, they don't have the easiest schedule. Again, they're road underdogs this week. They have to play... The very tough Northwestern Wildcats, not that far down the line. Uh, but what do you see with this Minnesota team after what we saw last night? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's incredibly unlikely that they make the playoff. Uh, my numbers put it at 1 in 40. Wow. That they make the playoff. So, yeah, it's going to be rare. And, I mean, just look at their road, right? They, they're at Iowa this week. Uh, I give them a 37% chance to win that game. They host Wisconsin, and their win probability is going to be 28% in that game. Mm-hmm. Okay, So, I mean, if, if they just win one of those two games, they're going to win the Big Ten West, uh, which would be a huge accomplishment for that program. But then, as a one-loss team, you're going to be facing Ohio State right. in the Big Ten championship game, and that's not going to go well. <laughs> so, I mean, there's just so many hurdles um, yeah. for this team. You know, my numbers are a little bit lower on Minnesota than than uh, what Bill Connolly and Rufus Peabody do. Uh, I'd be interested right. to see what, what Rufus has this week on it. But, I mean, it's it's not it's not likely that the Golden Gophers are going to the playoff. I think Rufus mentioned he had them 13 or somewhere yeah, in there somewhere. last week. Yeah, I, I remember what he said. I can look up Bill's, uh, Bill Connolly's. But I know I think Rufus said he would, they were around 13 last week. Uh, I know that SP Plus, uh, Bill Connolly's number at ESPN, is pretty high on their offense specifically. I think they were like mm-hmm. a 12th, somewhere, 8th to 12th, somewhere in there. So they're pretty right. high on them. Uh, but again, I also understand 
and it's also a different discussion when we're talking about the playoff because a one-loss Minnesota team heading into the Big Ten championship game is not going to finish as a one-loss team, most likely. So I think that it makes sense that your numbers are so low on them. Another big takeaway that I thought was pretty interesting, and you mentioned this in your post too, is that the Pac-12 is actually in a pretty good spot. Uh, We've got... Yeah, they've got Oregon at six and Utah at seven. Both those are one-loss teams, and one of them is going to probably be the Pac-12 champion. So what do you see about those two teams right now? Because it looks like, at least just based on these rankings, they're in a really good spot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I think there's a really good... Basically, if you have a one-loss Pac-12 champion, they're in the conversation for the playoff. That right. doesn't mean they're absolutely going to make the playoff, right. but they're certainly in the conversation, right? So they're they're, they're going to be. I mean, who knows what the probability is, but um, I, I make assumptions in my model. The other thing you have to remember is that um, you know if Georgia loses, they're going to fall below both those below the Pac-12 champion. Um, and then the other thing that we've seen from the committee is that after championship week, a team that has just won a conference championship tends to get a bump over a team that was idle that week. Right. So you could see, like, say Utah beats Oregon, which my numbers would have by, you know, a point and a half on a neutral site. Utah would probably jump over an idle Alabama team. And so that's how you're going to get the Pac-12 champ and, and, and a one-loss Pac-12 champ right. uh, into the top four uh, and making that. And, and there's about a 75% chance that, that the Pac-12 gets a team in. Right. And I think the the one loser here is Oklahoma. Um, They had a tight game with Iowa State this past week. They moved down in the ranking to number 10. I understand why they went down, but they have to, you know, Minnesota is probably going to fall. Penn State will probably fall because they would not be in that uh, in their championship game in the Big Ten. One of Utah and Oregon will probably fall out of there. But Oklahoma has to jump a lot of teams. And They do pay, play Baylor this week, and Baylor is a very good football team. They are 9-0. and They're number 13 in the college football playoff rankings. But it looks like a tough road ahead for Oklahoma. What do your numbers say about Oklahoma's odds to make it to the playoff? Yeah, I mean, they're at 35%, so they're kind of in the same boat as kind of Utah and, and Oregon. You know, can they get that bump from the, from the conference championship? Um, I mean, they may be in a tough situation, but they're in a better situation than Alabama. True. Um, who is almost certainly not going to the SEC championship game now, going to be sitting there idle. Obviously, that, that, that hasn't stopped them from sneaking in the playoff before and, and winning a national title. But uh, they certainly don't control their destiny. Oklahoma, in some sense, does. Uh, they certain, I mean, Oklahoma, Utah, Oregon, they control their destiny to be in the conversation. Right. And Which then, is and then who knows? reassuring. Yeah, no, I mean, that's about that's about the only thing that you really can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I want to say one other thing. Like, I have LSU at 62%. That's an underestimate. Um, we've often seen the committee take the top team, and if they lose a close game, only bump them down to fourth. Yeah. You know, if Georgia, you know, kicks a late field goal to beat LSU in the SEC championship game, I can see Georgia getting in, LSU dropping to fourth, having two SEC teams in there. Um so uh, that's a little bit of an underestimate. Uh, my model could be a little bit better there. But I, I do think LSU is a, a pretty strong team to, to make it right now. Well, let's stick with Georgia because you mentioned them. Let's talk about their game because they are facing Auburn this weekend. Uh, Georgia, a three-point favorite here. The total is 44. And this is Georgia's last chance before the SEC championship game to prove it's worth to, their, to, their worth to the committee. And it's a tough spot, but they are so, also are now up to four. If they lose, things are going to look a whole lot different at the top end of, the, of these rankings. So uh, right. how do you see this game playing out between Georgia and Auburn in Alabama? Yeah, I mean, my numbers do favor Georgia, but it's it's only seven-tenths of a point in their favor. So really sees a toss-up game. Remember, Georgia's on the road at Auburn. And the, the advantage that uh, Auburn has is really in the data from this year. So you have to remember that they, they beat Oregon to open the season. That win looks better with every passing week of the season. Auburn also has the best defense in the nation by my adjusted success rate. And so they're really excelling on on that side of the ball. And, you know, Georgia and Auburn are really tight when you only consider data from the current season. So by points, uh, Auburn's a little bit ahead of Georgia. When you look at adjusted success rate as a team, uh, Georgia's a little bit ahead of Auburn. 
but if you take that estimate, um, it, it suggests that that are that, like they're very equal and that the home field should push the push uh, this game in term in in favor of Auburn. Now, obviously, with I also include a little bit of the preseason and and a big component from the markets. That's what pushes it back towards Georgia and actually makes them the favorite in this game. Um, but it should be a really tight game, and and we'll we'll see how it goes. Is that discrepancy between your numbers and the spread enough where you would have confidence in betting Auburn plus three? Or do you think that there is enough ambiguity here where you'd rather just stay away at this number? I mean, I haven't pulled the trigger yet, but it's definitely something that I'm 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 interested in. Yeah. Um, I think I think Auburn is a is a good football team. Um, Georgia's Georgia's a great program. Mm-hmm. We we always thought of them as kind of the third best program in the nation, or at least coming into this year, we thought of them as the third best program um, behind Clemson and Alabama. Obviously, things have shifted around with the emergence of LSU, but you know, I, and I think they're a top five program, um, but they're they're also fa- facing a very good team on the road in Auburn. And I think the biggest advantage Georgia has over Auburn is a quarterback, but the problem is that Georgia. Right handcuffs its quarterback basically by <laughs> right. I don't I get it's hard to tell it's hard to separate player from system you know like is Georgia yeah. forcing Jake Fromm to try all these these you know bunny passes or is it just Jake Fromm himself doing that right but from eight yards per attempt this year it's down from nine uh both as a freshman and as a sophomore his adjusted yards per attempt despite throwing only three picks is down to, to 8.5 it was 10.1 last year, and I, I, I wish that they would let him open it up because I feel like this offense could be a lot better if they would, but it's hard to assume a deviation in coaching when we have such a large right. sample on that not happening, and it really does mitigate, at least in my eyes, the one big advantage Georgia has here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this has been talked about a lot, and, you know, I mean, the thing is, like, this doesn't really seem like the best week to open it up. I mean, right. Auburn's defense is excellent. True. So... We'll see what they come out with their game plan. You know, I mean, yeah. especially being on the road, you can see them potentially being a little conservative. Right. Again, uh, sticking with the status quo there. Let's move now <laughs> to Oklahoma at Baylor. And again, this one also pretty big from the college football playoff perspective because Baylor, you know, still sitting 13th despite being undefeated. Uh, and if they were to beat Oklahoma, that'd obviously be a pretty big boost to their resume. But Oklahoma trying to make the playoff, too, after that loss to K-State. Oklahoma right now, 10-point favorite. It is a 67.5-point total. This game is in Baylor. And Baylor's won a bunch of tight games this year, but they've remained undefeated. Oklahoma got to flex some muscles. So do you think that Oklahoma is good enough to cover a pretty big spread on the road against an undefeated team? Yeah, I mean, my numbers think this line is pretty efficient. Uh, they make the number 10.2 points. So you certainly wouldn't bet Oklahoma based on my number. Uh, what what I see in this Oklahoma team is is that they look good by adjusted success rate. They're 18th in the nation. That is very high for, for this program. Obviously didn't really show that last week against Iowa State. Yeah. Um, and they were 16th before that game. Um, but... You know, my numbers do see a lot of strength on that Oklahoma defense. Rufus talked last week about how the markets are, are undervaluing Oklahoma, and I'm sure that's a big component of what his numbers see as well. I know he's, right. he uses a success rate. So, and then on the other side of the ball, you know, Baylor hasn't looked great their last two outings. Uh, really should have lost against, could have lost against TCU, ended up winning in overtime, uh, and didn't look good against probably not a very good West Virginia team. So, you know, numbers-wise, uh, in adjusted success rate, they look pretty good, uh, like 23rd on offense, 33rd on defense. So a very strong team, probably not a team that should be undefeated at this point in the season. Right. And I talked about Charlie Brewer as a quarterback going into the West Virginia game, and he was part of why I wanted uh, Baylor minus the points there. I was laying the points, and I said, you know, Charlie Brewer's playing really well. And then against TCU, a good defense, mind you. I, I don't want to, you know, overblow that. He really struggled. Uh, he had 41 pass attempts, 195 passing yards. And that's not ideal, I guess, is the way to phrase that. And now he's facing an Oklahoma defense that your numbers view as being pretty legit. Um, any read on the total here? It's a 67 and a half. We like the Oklahoma defense. Baylor's defense has played pretty well, too. But Oklahoma's offense has been awesome. So that total is interesting, I think. Uh, what do you? What do your numbers say about that one? Yeah, I mean, my numbers have been... Um on every Oklahoma under essentially, <laughs> sorry, over. Well, yeah. geez, can't believe I missaid that. 
Um, they have been on every Oklahoma over. I mean, it makes it about 79 points. I'm starting to realize like that might be a little bit of an exaggeration. Sure. Uh, it, it's probably shooting a little bit high on that. Doesn't I mean they they may still go over. Um, sure. But but part of it is 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 that. You know, when I when I look at that, it's looking at my yards per play numbers, and Oklahoma is really excelling in that statistical category just because they're breaking so many big plays. Right. Um, but obviously, if Baylor can stop them there, it's a whole nother story in terms of where the total in this game is going to end up. For sure. So interesting game here. I think that it'll tell us a lot. Uh, have big implications for the playoff, as will the Georgia Auburn game. So should be a pretty fun week. We're going to talk about a couple more games here in just one second with covering the future. But first. If you uh, want to find the best value in each game you're trying to bet, make sure you check out Odds Fire because Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games. Look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have cooked up over at numberfire.com. Odds Fire is the premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on NumberFire or at OddsFire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's pause for a second here and then come back and take a look at what the numbers say for this week. Covering the future. All right, Ed, let's stick with college football here for week number 12 as we shift to covering the future. What do you have on your mind uh, for week 12? What's standing out when you look at your numbers for this week's slate of games? So it's been it's pretty interesting to look at the spread in Michigan State games the the last couple of weeks. Uh, they were a twenty point favorite at home against Illinois, um, which they looked like they were going to cover in the first. They they did cover it in the first half until everything went to crap in in the second half, and Illinois came back and and somehow won that game. Um, and now it has kind of shifted to uh, so so before I, I always kind of thought even without looking at my numbers that that Michigan should be about a seven to 10 point favorite in this game. Um, so they, they started, they started out based on that Illinois loss. They started out as a 14 point Michigan started out as a 14 point favorite, which I, which I think is crazy. My number puts it closer to seven. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be a tough game, but then when you look over and look at the total, I think that is where there's potentially even more value. Uh, the total is at 44 right now. And you're really looking at two programs that have had elite defenses, uh, Michigan's defense has still been strong. They're 12th in my adjusted success rate. The, they've seen a lot of improvement on the defensive line since the beginning of the season. And this unit is really playing well. Michigan State's defense is is, is an elite unit. They've kind of fallen off a little bit since last year. They're, they're 13th when I look at adjusted success rate. But still a program um, that's going to bring it on on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, we've, we've, we're, we're seeing kind of offenses for both these teams that are evolving. Uh, Michigan State is actually significantly better than they were last year. Uh, Brian Lewerke is actually healthy. He's making throws like he did two years ago when his shoulder was was healthy. He's a good runner. Um, and, and Michigan's offense has, has gotten a lot better since the beginning of the year, too. But still, 44 points. Um, my numbers suggest lower, and I think that's where the value is in this game. Yeah, and I think that it's, it's pretty interesting um, to – Look at this game. Uh, it sounds like Brian Lewerke's probably going to play, um, despite the concussion against Illinois. So I think that that ambiguity would also lead towards the under there. Uh, but it does seem like he is probably going to play for this week. And you said you, like, you had it at like a seven-point spread, right, in favor of Michigan? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I want to hear your thoughts on the Michigan offense, because obviously you watch more Michigan games than – Probably most of our listeners, I would guess, uh, in, in me as well. What have been your thoughts on the offense recently? Because we've had a lot of discussions about them. Do you think that what we've seen recently is what we should expect going forward? Yeah, I, I, I think the offense is a work in progress. I mean, they yeah. had so many high expectations coming into the year. And then they were just really terrible at the beginning of the season. Um, they couldn't do anything right just got smashed by Wisconsin. And then you saw improvement. Uh, they, they threw the ball really well against Rutgers. I know it's Rutgers, but <laughs> that was progress for, for the unit. But you could still see that the run game was really struggling kind of through those middle games. Now the run game has really come along in the last couple of games. They're, are, they're running the ball uh, really well, and they were able to continue that against Maryland. <laughs> but then the passing game was, was, I mean, literally terrible against Maryland. Um, they, 
they were only able they were success, successful on about 30 percent of their plays uh it didn't look as bad because they they had a couple of uh deep shots um that they were able to convert so it didn't look at quite as bad from yards per pass attempt perspective but that was not a good game for michigan's pass offense yeah. so i would say it's still a work in progress uh and, and i mean it just gets so much tougher against the michigan state defense that's going to bring one of the best defensive lines in the country into this game and like i said they haven't played as well as they did last year, but I, I still expect a lot from from the Michigan State defense. And if you expect Michigan to run the football more and run the ball effectively, that does also lend itself towards an under. So I think that makes sense uh, with the under there at well, thirty four points. But I don't know if they're going to be able to run the ball that well. That's true. I mean, so <laughs> you know, like I mean, their best bet is probably to air it out with Patterson, and and he yeah. can certainly do that. Um, but you know, the 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 passing game is is a work in progress. I mean, I think after the Maryland game. A lot of people in Ann Arbor are more optimistic about the run game, which was yeah. literally like dreadful three games ago. Right. So, so it's a work in progress. We'll see. It's it's been a it's been a great soap opera this year. It's been fun to have you like on the show though, because like I can't understand them. You understand them better than I do. I think that we're both well, a little confused about them, but like yeah. you still have a better grasp on them than I do. I would be very confused if I didn't get to talk to you each week. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. I'm glad I can help. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one offense that I don't find quite as confusing is Clemson. I want to talk about them for my covering the future because last week I liked the over on Clemson and I want it over again. I, I, they are, it's a 59 and a half right now against Wake Forest. And Wake Forest is a team that tends to play well towards overs because they're a pretty up-tempo team here. They average the second most plays per game across college football, and they do operate a bit more slowly on the road, which makes sense. You know, you want to increase the variance, decrease the sample size uh, when you are on the road, but it's still 73 plays per game when they're on the road. I think it's like 90 when they're at home, which is just kind of nuts. And this game is on the road in Clemson, and they did just lose their stud receiver, Sage Surratt, uh, which is downgrade for the offense, downgrade for the over here. But their quarterback, Jamie Newman, has been pretty good this year. He is healthy once again. He has averaged 8.6 adjusted yards per attempt. He is a dynamic runner as well, which is a plus. And I don't think this is a spot where Wake Forest offense gets totally blanked, even while respecting this Clemson defense a lot. I respect them a lot, but I still think Clemson should score you know, a couple touchdowns or so here, which bodes well because I think Clemson's offense is going to do a lot of work here once again. We're up to a five-game sample now since Clemson had their bye in early October, and the reason that I want to focus on that is because they had the injuries uh, to Justin Ross. They had a couple more injuries earlier in the year as well. I think Amari Rogers was hurt. Trevor Lawrence apparently had a shoulder injury too. But since that bye, they've had five games. They've averaged 52.6 points per game in that time, and their games have averaged 63.6 points per game. Trevor Lawrence, individually, his adjusted yards per attempt is up to 11.5 in that five-game sample. And Number Fire projects Clemson to score 49.3 points here, which means we need 11 out of Wake Forest for the over to hit. And the Number Fire algorithms have it hitting the over 71% of the time. So I think that's a pretty good number for me. Again, it's a 59 and a half right now as they face Wake Forest. Forest, it's not a ton of faith. In the Wake Forest offense, for me, it's more so I think that they will score something and then Clemson can do the rest themselves uh, and hit the over here on 59 and a half points. But Ed, we've talked about this Clemson offense and I understand the concerns that success rate has, but I guess for me, I want to focus more on the recent sample. I also understand that that's dangerous though. So what do your numbers say about Clemson as a whole offensively? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to focus less on my numbers and, and what uh, Eric Eager was able to give me at PFF. So he, Trevor Lawrence actually grades out better this year than he did last year in terms of his passing grade. And I I, I think that's interesting. I mean, that suggests that there, there shouldn't really be much of a drop-off. This is the same guy that came in and, and really revitalized that offense after four games last year, took him all the way to the national title. Um, and those pre-FF grades suggest that that he should be capable of doing that again this year and leading a very dynamic offense. Yeah, for sure. And I think we've seen some of that start to come together recently, uh, which I think is interesting here. I think that this Clemson team is just better than they were playing earlier in the year. So I 
I, to my detriment sometimes, enjoy looking at small samples when I believe there is a reason to believe the full sample is tainted, and I think that may be the case here with Clemson, given the fact that they, you know, like, as you've mentioned, Dabo likes to get his guys in there early in the year, and there were some injuries too, so I think there is value in small samples when I think the small sample is more relevant, and I think that's the case here with Clemson, so I do want the over here on 59 and a half against Wake Forest. That's all we have for college football today, Ed. Uh, anything else you want to to pump out there? Anything uh, going on outside of sports right now that you want to talk about or anything? Yeah, I mean, definitely check out the football analytics show this week. Uh, there's both an audio and written version of my results from the, the college football playoff. We did talk about a lot of that on this show. Um, but if you want to have if, if you want to listen to the whole thing, it's out there. Uh, and then uh, I, I don't know. It's been a busy week. There hasn't been much time for too much stuff outside of uh, a football so Tuesdays head are, towards the weekend tuesdays are my one night of the week where i don't have a lot going so i actually watched two television shows last night um, awesome have you read his dark materials the philip pullman novels they might mm. they were probably out of, like they're they were very much young adult novels when i was a young adult so cool. they probably didn't hit your demographic uh, but do you ever hear those or read those mm. okay they're, they they're pretty interesting uh, but it's an hbo show now um okay. And it's not bad. Uh, I would say it might be pretty confusing if you did not read the books, but it's pretty fun. We've also been watching Watchmen, uh, which is now oh, a yeah. show on HBO. That's been pretty good, too. So uh, my Tuesdays are cherished, is what nice. I would say. Did you read Watchmen as a... I should have. I didn't. I had a friend okay. who was super into it. So like we saw the movie uh, right. when it came out. The movie lacked in a lot of areas, uh, right. I guess is the generous way to put that. Uh, but... I've actually never read a graphic novel ever. Interesting. Interesting. I would be interested in them, but I just I just haven't. So um, yeah, Watchmen's it's fascinating to me because uh, so we really got into the Marvel movies last year, uh, watched all of them, and then I, I read a book called Slugfest, which was about the rivalry between Marvel and and DC, yeah. and and essentially DC was kind of kicking their butt, and then in the '60s, like Marvel really took off with Spider Man and the Fantastic Four, and that 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 uh persisted for a lot of years and Watchmen was kind of dc's response to that yeah. they're like oh wait maybe we should actually write good stories <laughs> so i think in the 80s that's what happened with Watchmen. i, I mean i personally never read it but i thought the 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 battle between the two comic yeah. book companies was, was pretty interesting and it was also when um you know they started to do these money grabs with these like yeah. big launches of graphic novels which inherently is not a bad idea um right. But, you know, instead of doing episode uh, a week or, or comic book a week, they started doing, I think, bigger launches. And I think Watchmen was part of that, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The show's pretty good. I've enjoyed it a lot. I like it more than the movie. So um, if you get bored, check that out. It's, uh, it's an HBO show, but it's, it's pretty fun. Um, I think I'll probably be binging the Marvel movies at some point again soon. Like, I know that they're not You've seen the them highest. All? What's that? I've You've seen, seen them all? most of them, I think. Um, but Disney Plus just came out, and we have that. So... I now have oh, access you have to it? all of them. Yeah. Uh, have you watched The Mandalorian? No, I haven't. Uh, so, confession, I have not seen all the Star Wars movies. <laughs> what? Um, it's the prequels, though. I've seen, I've seen only one of the prequels. I have not seen the other two. And I think I've been told that's okay. No. But I, I don't need to see those. Not okay. Well, this is, this is, this is my hot take that's going to make okay. 90% of the people listening to this hate me. Okay. Um, episode three is my favorite Star Wars movie. Interesting. It ties everything together. Okay. Um, Revenge of the Sith. This is a very, very unpopular opinion. I, mean, I don't think episode one is particularly good, but two and yeah. three are definitely. Those are the should... two I haven't seen. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've enjoyed the like the newer ones. I thought I think those have been fun. Um, yeah. But like, I just never got that into any of them. Um, so I probably I don't even know if I'll watch the Mandalorian. I think my fiance wants to watch them, but like. Yeah. There's no more Great British Bake Off for her to watch. Maybe she can watch that instead of that, and I'll just kind of Oh, yeah, like... that, that ended. My wife yeah. watches that. I watched yeah, that so her. she can sit and watch The Mandalorian, and I'll, like, do work or something and, like, hang out. But um, <laughs> as opposed to not paying attention to Great British Bake Off, which is a fun show, too. But, um, yeah. yeah, I can't be Yeah, I don't know if I'm getting this Disney Plus. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not ready to commit to that. It, I will say it's nice to be able to just, like, pop on Iron Man whenever I feel like it. So. Oh, that is a good movie. Yeah, so like that's been enjoyable, but I don't know. It's 
I'm getting stretched pretty thin <laughs> with yeah, paying all the, yeah, for, for these sure. things. So uh, we'll see how much further I can go. But I did, I did splurge here. So I guess I'll be doing that later today as well. That is all we have for today. Again, don't forget to subscribe to Ed's newsletter. Uh, go to thepowerrank.com to sign up for that and find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sanis, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. We have a DFS podcast for NFL Week 11 coming out tomorrow morning uh, on the Never Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. And also, our Week 11 NFL preview from a betting perspective with Edward Egros will be up here on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Find that wherever you can get your podcast. And while you're there, please leave a rating and review as well. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald for running the video side of things for today, as always. And shout up these clips for the at FanDuel Twitter account. Thank you, Cal. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in for today for this episode of Covering the Spread. Good luck with your college football bets and those college basketball ones as well. And we'll talk to you again tomorrow. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>